to the virtual broadcast of the St. James Baptist Church. This is the church where God is exalted, the name of Jesus lifted, and the body of Christ edified. We thank you so kindly for tuning in this morning to worship with us as we seek to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth on this second Sunday in June. And we take uh, pride in saying congratulations to all of our 2021 graduates. Continue to be well, be safe in your travels. Today's Old Testament scripture will be taken from Psalm 20 and it reads as follows. To the leader is Psalm of David. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. Selah. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May he shout for joy over your victory and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. The end of the reading. The New Testament scripture for this morning will be taken from the gospel as penned by Mark, chapter 4, verses 26 to 34, and it reads as follows. The parable of the growing seed. He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. The parable of the mustard seed. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The use of the parables. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The end of the New Testament reading. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, and our Mother, the God of creation story, the God of our salvation and glory, we bless your name throughout this sanctuary this morning. We pray you for being a great God. We pray you for the God that you are, and we thank you for everything that you've ever done for us, even from the rocking of our cradles to this very present moment. Bless this worship experience this morning in a very special way. Crown us with godly wisdom and infuse us with Holy Ghost intelligence, that we all may apply our hearts to wisdom for the balance of our days, that we shall be blessing to all those that we encounter and engage along our sacred journey. And then, Lord God, we ask that you would bless the whole people of the St. James Baptist Church, uh, bless the sick and the shut-in, bless our visiting friends from around the nation. And we pray a special prayer this morning for the family of Chaplain Kimberly Campbell, for the family of Mr. Calvin McDonald, 
Be with them, Lord God, in a very special way. It is our hope and it's our heart's desire that you will give them an oil of joy and a garment of praise for the days of mourning and bereavement. And that you would have them all to realize and recognize you in the fullness of your grace and the healing power of your love. This is your servant's prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Following our sermonic selection, the next voice you will hear this morning will be that of Reverend Yvette Whiting as she comes to us with this sermon entitled, An Opportunity of a Lifetime. Iron Mike and Kid Dynamite in his early career. 
and later known as the baddest man on the planet, Tyson is considered one of the best heavyweight boxers of all time. He reigned as the undisputed world heavyweight champion from 1987 to 1990. Tyson won his first 19 professional fights by knockout, 12 of them in the first round, claiming his first belt at 20 years, four months, and 22 days old. Tyson holds the record for the youngest boxer to win a heavyweight title. He was the first heavyweight boxer to simultaneously hold the WBA, WBC, and IBF titles, as well as the only heavyweight to unify them in succession. Tyson became the lineal champion when he knocked out Michael Spinks in 91 seconds of the first round in 1990. Don't blink. A Tyson fight was bigger than a Super Bowl, the World Series, and the NBA championship. Everybody who was anybody was at ringside for one of his fights. When the model died in November of 1985, and when he severed ties with his trainer, Jim Jacobs, he became easy prey. He began to make bad choices, domestic violence and drugs, depression and a rocky marriage caused his life to down spiral. And when he began to take for granted his ability and fail to prepare, fail to discipline his body, fail to discipline himself, Tyson lost his title to the underdog, Buster Douglas, in one of the biggest upsets in history when he was knocked out in the 10th round in 1992. Tyson was convicted of rape and sentenced to six years in prison, although he was released on parole after three years. After his release in 1995, he engaged in a series of comeback fights, regaining the WBA and the WBC titles in 1996 to join Floyd Patterson, Muhammad Ali, Tim Witherspoon, Evander Holyfield, and George Foreman as the only men in boxing to have regained a heavyweight championship after losing it. After being stripped of the WBC title in the same year, Tyson lost the WBA title to Evander Holyfield by an 11th round stoppage. Their 1997 rematch ended with Tyson being disqualified for biting Holy, Holyfield's ear. One bite notoriously being strong enough to remove a portion of his right ear. In 2002, Tyson fought for the world heavyweight title, losing by knockout to Lennox Lewis. Following his jail sentence, Tyson sought to get his life on track and converted to Islam. He visited Mecca on a pilgrimage in 2010. Tyson was given opportunities of a lifetime, and yet he squandered them. Today, he's performing in Las Vegas for survival. He went from being the heavyweight champion to becoming a shadow boxing sideshow. Yet, in a way, he's more successful now than he was as a boxer because he understands his self, his weakness, and his potential for failure. And armed with this knowledge, his endeavor is to be the best man, the best husband, the best father that he can be, and no one can fault him for that. Mike Tyson's story is about the choices that he made with the opportunities he was given. This morning's message is about a man in the Bible who squandered the opportunities that were given to him. It is titled, An Opportunity of a Lifetime. Join me in reading this morning's text. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, 1 Kings chapter two, 
verses 8 and 36 through 46. And remember, you have with you Shimei, son of Jerah the Benjamite from Barum, who called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Manahiam. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do to him. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. Then the king sent and summoned Shemai and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and live there, and do not go out from there to any place whatever. For on the day you go out and cross the Wadi Kidron, know for certain that you shall die. Your blood shall be on your own head. And Shemai said to the king, the sentence is fair, as my lord the king has said, so will your servant do. So Shemai lived in Jerusalem many days. But it happened at the end of three years that two of Shemai's slaves ran away to King Akish, son of Megam Gad. When it was told Shemai, your slaves are in Gad, Shemai rose and saddled a donkey and went to Akish in Gad to search for his slaves. Shemai went and brought his slaves from Gad. When Solomon was told that Shemai had gone from Jerusalem to Gad and returned, the king sent and summoned Shemai and said to him, Did I not make you swear by the Lord and solemnly, and solemnly adjure you, saying, Know for certain that on the day you go out and go to any place whatsoever, you shall die. And you said to me, the sentence is fair, I accept. Why then have you not kept your oath to the Lord and the commandment which I have charged you? The king also said to Shemai, the Lord will bring back your evil on your own head, but King Solomon shall be blessed and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. Then the king commanded Benaiah, son of Jehodi, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. The end of the reading. The text finds us just following the death of King David and at the beginning of the reign of Solomon. Rewind and it looks like an episode taken from the playbook of Game of Thrones. Adonijah, another son of King David, a road son, has proclaimed himself the king. King David, the aged king, lays on his bed awaiting death with a pretty young thing cuddled at his feet. His wife sits at his bedside, advocating on behalf of her son to be sure that his future is sure, to be sure that his inheritance is sure, to be sure that David keeps his word. And seating at her side is Nathan the prophet, who has provided her wise counsel and instruction to be sure that Solomon is his father's successor. After declaring Solomon king, David provides him with a litany of names, including those who wronged, offended, or betrayed, or opposed him, in addition to those whom Solomon must show kindness. David had a long memory. King Solomon carried out his father's orders quickly. A Gator, the priest, who sided with Absalom and should have been slain, was shown mercy. He was removed from his priestly duties, thereby fulfilling prophecy. Joab, the captain of war, 
came into the sanctuary and held on to the horns of the altar, refusing to let go in an attempt to save his own life. It did him no good. He was slain because it was decreed by the king. The altar in the sanctuary had four horns and there was a custom of people seeking asylum, hanging onto the horns in the sanctuary for mercy, for clemency. And now came Shimei. Shimei was a part of King Saul's clan. When King David was forced to flee from his son Absalom, who coveted his father's throne, Shimei met him along the way. As King David approached Barham, a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there. His name was Shimei, son of Gera, and he cursed as he came out. He pelted David and all the king's officials with stones. And though all the troops were on the right and the left of David, he cursed him. Shimei blamed David for King Saul's death during the battle with the Philistines. Saul had in fact fallen on his own sword to escape capture by the enemy. But Shimei still accused David of murder and announced that this was the reason Absalom was taking over the kingdom. David's men wanted to kill Shimei. They wanted to kill him then and there. But David in his despair believed that the Lord had sent Shimei to curse him. And he refused to allow his men to kill him. David and his party resumed their journey and Shimei continued to follow cursing and throwing stones and dirt at them. And now here's David's son, Solomon, showing him mercy with a caveat. Shimei was literally given an opportunity of a lifetime. His life was spared and he was to live and stay in Jerusalem. As long as he kept the terms of their agreement, not to leave Jerusalem, he could continue to live. God is merciful to David, so Solomon showed mercy to Shimei. That is mercy with conditions. Mercy provided certain requirements were met. Mercy provided boundaries were kept and provided good judgment was used. And in this case, mercy so long as an agreement between the king and his subject is honored. The fact that mercy has been extended means that there is still opportunity. And here we see the new king, Solomon, showing mercy because he understood mercy. His father David understood, was shown and showed mercy. Remember, O oh Lord, the tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been of old. David knew that he could have been dead, should have been dead, and would have been dead if it hadn't been for God in his own life. And he understood that everything that he was and everything that he had came from God. Now, God, too, has a long memory. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. But some people think that they don't have to live by the rules. Somehow, they think that they can circumvent the rules. Like Adonijah, they always have some type of an angle. They're always trying to finesse their way in. They think that they can get over and that they can get through. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is destruction. Some people think that they have an understanding with God, and the fact that God hasn't dealt with their sin means that he is complicit or that he is okay with it. But God will not be mocked. 
The wage of sin is still dead, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Like Joab, some people think that they can save their lives by entering the sanctuary, by attending church. And while you might find solace in the sanctuary, you will not obtain salvation by attending. Salvation is the free gift of God and it cannot be earned. It was purchased at a price and it is only through accepting God's reward at Christ's expense that you can be saved. The maker and creator of all things desired that none should perish. Rather, that all should have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The way that Solomon dealt with Shammai is an example of the way that God works. He knows our sins, but he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. In a kingdom, there is a king and there are subjects. God becomes the king of our lives when we accept God's forgiveness, when we accept God's grace. In fact, God's gift of grace is an olive branch extended by the hands of the creator of the tree. Imagine that. It is the God of the very gods saying, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be as crimson, they shall be as wool. Like Shemai, some people have failed to honor their commitments to the king. Like Mike Tyson, some people's lives are a down spiral. God sees the mess that some have gotten themselves into. There are people who don't even realize that they're in a mess. There are people who won't understand that they're in a mess until they are thick in it, stuck in it, sinking deep in sin, bound by the devil, shackled and unable to free themselves from the predicament that they are in. But God in his wisdom, oh God in his mercy, gives grace upon grace and shows his love in that he put on an earthly body descended heaven's stairwell, entered this earthly realm of man, and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He gives us an opportunity of a lifetime. And if you are a subject in his kingdom, he teaches you what you need to know. He shows you how to live. He gives you his spirit who is sealed with you until the day of redemption. And he gives you his living word to hide in your heart so that you might not sin against him. To be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He sent his son not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. That's grace. So that when we find ourselves in trouble, he is there. An ever-present help in time of need. When we find ourselves entangled in the things of this world, bound by the devil, he sets us free. And who the Lord has set free is free indeed. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. When we get weary, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now that's mercy. Mercy for they that love God. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a planted tree by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now that's mercy. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chafe which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And if you recognize your sinfulness and you need for a savior, this is mercy that we can draw upon. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mercy doesn't cancel suffering. We're gonna suffer because Christ suffered. If we live a little, we're gonna do battle. And every battle has its casualties. But God will not leave you without the tools necessary to win the fight. In fact, God has met us here to say, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then you shall call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, I will turn away your captivity. This doesn't mean that there won't be consequences and repercussions for the sin and choices that you've made. You've done things and you haven't done things, but God can and he will be with you in your circumstances and he will provide you peace, not as the world cannot give, but peace that surpasses understanding so that through your life choices, you may have cut yourself short. You may have left yourself maimed, ashamed, have left yourself jobless, lifeless, clueless, wifeless. He wants to show you mercy. He wants you to live and spend your eternity with him. Today he stands at the door and he knocks. And if you open the door, he will come in and fellowship with you. Today he offers you an opportunity of a lifetime. They say that opportunity only knocks once, but God keeps on knocking. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and you will experience an opportunity of a lifetime. God's grace for the free pardoning of your sin and you will be set free and you will imbibe in God's mercy and his tender mercies that are new every day. Perhaps you're hesitant to accept God's call to salvation because you believe that you don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. There are no big you's or little me's in God's sight. All of our works are like filthy rags and all the ground is level at the foot of a cross. We need a savior. We all need the savior. And we are being and we are becoming, but we haven't arrived yet. Today, God is inviting you to come just as you are that you might have abundant life if only you would accept this opportunity of a lifetime. 
Know this, that God continues to knock, but tomorrow is not promised. I wouldn't chance missing this opportunity of a lifetime today. I hope we'll all be ready when Jesus comes. Amen. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Just now. Just services on our church's website or you can watch us on Facebook where we encourage you to leave comments regarding today's sermon, share the video with family members or friends, or even start your own watch party. Thank you to those that continue to give faithfully to this ministry despite these trying economic times. If you would like to give, please send your check or money order to the St. James Baptist Church or you can give online through our church's website using Giveify. To learn how, please watch this short video following the service. Givelify is giving simplified. Givelify is the simplest, most beautiful way to give and track donations to the place of worship or charity of your choice. You're not limited to the cash you have on hand. There's no need to write checks, and there are no complicated forms to fill out or text message codes to remember. Givelify automatically pinpoints your location and intelligently identifies the fundraiser, worship service, or conference you're attending without the need to search. Since Givelify automatically detects where you are, making a donation can be completed in as few as three taps. Tap 1. Use one of the pre-configured denominations to choose your donation amount. Tap 2. Select the campaign to which you'd like to contribute. Tap 3. With your stored credit or debit card, complete your donation in one tap and get an immediate donation receipt. Setting up recurring giving is a simple two-tap process. Tap the frequency you'd like and you'll never forget to make your gift. Givelify lets you easily see your complete donation history. Mark the place of worship you normally attend as your home for quick one-tap access. Givelify. Tap. Give. Done.